Welcome to the Durham University in conversation with Professor Alejandro Caparros on the occasion of the launch of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report number six. My name is Laura Marcelliani. I am an Associate Professor of Economics, co-director of the Center for Environmental and Energy Economics and Durham University Business School, and fellow of the Durham Energy Institute. I will be hosting this event today. Our guest is Alejandro Caparros, professor in energy economics, co-director of the Center for Environmental and Energy Economics at Durham University Business School and fellow of the Durham Energy Institute. He currently serves as the lead author of the chapter on international cooperation for the sixth assessment report on climate change mitigation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on which he will be talking today. Professor Caparros has previously held position at the Institute for Public Goods and Policies of the Spanish National Research Council, the French National Center for Scientific Research, the Universities of Carlos Terciero and Paris East, and has been a visiting scholar at the University of Berkeley, Columbia, Paris II, Paris East, Bordeaux, Göttingen, Exeter, Bath, and Innsbruck. He has participated in a large number of research projects funded by the European Commission and national agencies, and has worked as consultant for the World Bank and the United Nations Statistics Division. He applies microeconomic tools, in particular game theory, to the analysis of negotiations over climate change and other global public goods. He's also interested in dynamic pollution control and the ecosystem accounting, focusing in the latter case on the treatment of public goods in monetary accounts. He has over 80 peer-reviewed publications in international world-leading journals. We will start this event with a short video explaining the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the scope of the assessment report number six. We will then welcome Professor Caparros and finally conclude with a few slides containing the main messages to take away from the conversation with Professor Caparros.
Welcome, Leandro. Thank you for coming in and uh, congratulations on the remarkable achievement of the launch of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report number six. Um, I would like to start this uh, conversation by asking you about the role of the IPCC in tackling the challenge of climate change. What does the IPCC do? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure. So what the IPCC does? More or less in the beginning of the last century, at the, at the end of the last century, in the early 90s, climate change became a problem. And then two institutions were start, started. One was the IPCC, basically the, regrouping the scientists of the world, and then the COPs. So we have the COPs going on every year, which is the conference of the parties, where they discuss at a high level the different countries how to tackle climate change. So the idea is that the IPCC uh, is the scientist involved in, in research on climate change, that they produce reports telling the politicians and the public in general what we know about climate change. So they produce a set of reports informing what we know about climate change. And then they, they are every six or seven years, more or less, they produce what is called an assessment report. That, and then they have, uh, in this particular case, we, was, we had the launch this year of one of this, the six assessment report. So we have that every six years they produce an assessment report. And in addition, they have some special reports with a commission. So for example, when the conference of the parties thinks that they need some additional information on land, in land use management and climate change, then they ask the scientists, so the IPCC, to produce a special report on that. But apart from the special reports, we have always this cycle of every seven years, more or less, an, uh, an assessment report. And in these assessment reports, we have three different ones. One is um, on the science, one is on adaptation, and one is on mitigation. And uh... What exactly is the IPCC AR6 report and what is its importance? Yes, so the IPCC, as I said, has a, a, every seven years a cycle where it produces these assessment reports that tells what we know about the science on these three domains that we refer to. And now we're on the sixth six, uh, cycle. And, they're gonna, and then the report on mitigation, so when I was involved, I'm going to focus this conversation more, is try to say what we know about how we can mitigate climate change. So basically the first one, the one on the scientific basis, tells us what we know, whether climate change is, exists or whether it's human induced. And there I have to say in this every report from R1 to R5, including R6, every time they have said it's clearer and clearer climate change exists, and it's also clearer and clearer that it's human and man-made, so human induced by humans. That's what the first report says. That's the one on the scientific basis. Then we have one on adaptation, so how we can adapt to climate change. And then we have one on mitigation. This is the one we are going to be talking here today. And the one on mitigation tells you what we know, what we, how we can reduce the impact of climate change, how we can reduce our emissions, what we can do in this sense. And what, why is this important, the one that we are talking about right now? R6 is important because it's the first one that, that it will be published after the Paris Agreement. So internationally, the, in the COPs, as I say, they meet every year, but they only sometimes they have make big agreements, very relevant agreements. In 97, we had the Kyoto Protocol, that was what we had before. With the Kyoto Protocol was a handful of countries, developed countries, which had, the, um, they had to reduce their emissions. It, it was legally binding to reduce the emissions, but only for a handful of countries, the, um, the more advanced economies, let's say. Now we have a completely different situation in the Paris Agreement, is where all countries in the world submit their pledges. They say how much they're gonna be reducing their emissions, but it's not legally binding anymore. It's just sending their pledges. And now, of course, the big question is whether this system is gonna work or not. And the first time that we are gonna assess the Paris Agreement from the IPCC is, and, and all this new system is in this uh, R6 on mitigation. And that's why I think it's a very important report because it will tell us, not a final question, but it will tell us whether the Paris Agreement is working or not. And we can discuss this in more detail afterwards if you want, but that's, I think, the reason why it's so important. Indeed. Alejandro, what are the issues addressed by the report and which message would you like to highlight? 
Yes, so the report is, is quite long and goes through a number of issues. Uh, I will just highlight a few of them, but there are, of course, many more. So it, it, ex it explores pathways which are compatible with the goal of the Paris Agreement, which is staying below 1.5 and 2 degrees. So it explores in quite a lot of detail which paths are compatible with that. I think that that's a very important contribution. It had already been done in, the, in a special report on 1.5 degree, but now it has been done for 1.5 and for 2 and with updated information. I think that's going to be very important for policymakers. It also discusses the pledges that have been done in the Paris Agreement and how they relate to this path which is with a compatible with 1.5 and 2 degrees um, warming, which I, I think I, I said already, but these are the goals in the Paris Agreement. It's very important for the whole report, the 1.5 and the 1 and 2 degrees, because the Paris Agreement, the, the main goal is to be global warming below 1.5 degrees or ideally, and if not below 2 degrees. This, of course, these are average global warming temperatures. It doesn't mean that in one particular area of the world is not going to warm more. But on average, we should try to keep it below these two figures. And they are very important for the report. And they come up all the time. So as I say, we have compatible, pledge, um, compatible pathways. We have pledges. And then we, it also goes sector by sector, what they can contribute to, to mitigation. So what the housing sector can do, what industry can do, what you can expect from land use, from agriculture, from, from forestry. So it goes through all these sectors. A, a novelty that was not, this was all in previous reports as well. A novelty that comes into this report is the, that also discusses uh, how people produce emissions and, and the social, uh, how you can, the societal components, societal components of producing emissions. This is a novelty which will be discussed in one of the chapters here, was not discussed before. Mm -hmm. Another thing is a discussion on the innovations, the role of innovation. So these are different chapters. So the, the, the report is distributed in different chapters and each chapter has a focus. Alphas usually, or, or almost in all cases, focus on only one chapter. In my case, my chapter was on international cooperation. So the one I, I know better, of course, is the chapter on international cooperation. And that's why when I go more into detail, I will go focusing on international cooperation because that's the one I have been working over the last years and the one I know better. The other ones, I mean, at the end, you have to be consistent. So you have to read what other chapters do. You have to be a little bit aware of what other chapters do, but it's not the main focus of your work. The main focus is the international cooperation. So what are things to, to highlight, you said also? Well, there's... As I said, we want to see after Paris Agreement how we are doing, basically. Well, the first message is too, too early to have a final answer. I mean, it's seven years, it's, it's not enough time to have a final answer because the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 and ratified in 2016. But that said, we have already some interesting results that we can discuss. So first of all, emissions continue to grow. We had actually the highest decadal increase in greenhouse gas emissions in history in the last 10 years. So from compared to, nine, to, to 2010, by 2019, emissions had grown about 12%. So it's a huge increase in emissions globally. Compared to, to 1990, I think it's, it's over 50% increase in emissions. So we are still increasing our emissions. Despite all the efforts that we have done in the last 30 years, we are still increasing our emissions. So that is one, let's say, on the negative side. On the more positive side, we have we, we have seen a growing number of countries which have been able to reduce their emissions over this 10 year periods. And that's also a novelty because in the past, no countries were always able to reduce their emissions. Now we have some countries able to reduce their emissions and we have to kind of expand this to more countries. Then related to, so we are doing something, but we are not doing enough. And then we know we have to reduce our emissions significantly in the next years because we have already from the, the there was already the, the report on 1.5 saying that from the IPCC, the special report, but it's confirmed now we need to reduce our emissions, eliminate basically by the mid of the next century, of this century, sorry. We have to eliminate our emissions. So we have to change dramatically the situation from a, a steady increase in emissions to almost stop emissions. So this implies a huge effort to be done, not only in the next 10 years, but in the next 30 years. But already focusing in the next 10 years, I think it's important to focus there because it's where we have to see in the action right now. Here we have already pledges from countries, but these pledges are bringing us closer to the goal, but not, not yet there. Well, first of all, one, one small caveat is important for the report. The, the Glasgow pledges in the COP, the pledges of Glasgow were not included because the report has to close somewhere and it closed in October. So all the, there are no publications after October which have been taken into account. So nothing that happens after October has been taken into account. So the, the important developments that we saw in Glasgow have not been taken into account. 
But with this caveat, Basically, there, there is some interesting in our chapter, of course, I'm referring again to my, to my chapter because the one we know better, but it shows already that for 2030, if you sum all the pledges in the world, it's about one third of the emission reductions that we would need to see by 2030 to stay in a path that is compatible below to stay below 1.5. So all the pledges, even pledges, as I say, are promises that come to do. They're not, uh, uh, they're, they're not legally binding. But these pledges, even if they are fulfilled, will be about one third of what we would need to do in the next 10 years for to stay on below 1.5, and would be about 50% of what we would need to do to stay below two degrees. So we still have a long way to go. So pledges need to be more ambitious in the future. We need to promote that. The second message, very related, is that out of these pledges, which I said is about a third of the 1.5 goal and a fifth of the 50% uh, of what we need to stay below 20, uh, two degrees, about half of them are what is called conditional pledges. And from our point of view, international cooperation, they are very important. So it's not in the, in the, in the named like that in the Paris Agreement, but there are two types of pledges. Some countries, usually more developed countries, have said, I will reduce my emissions by that much. That's it. These are the unconditional ones. But, uh, but about half the pledges say that we are called, I've always called conditional pledges by the literature. And they say, I will reduce my emissions by that if I get no help, and I will reduce it more if I get financial and technological help. Most developing countries, or what we used to be called developing countries, have done this kind of pledges. So for that, again, we need, a, we need to see the international cooperation in action in the next years. Because the problem that we have is, as I said, about 50% of the pledges, which are already insufficient, depend on international cooperation because they depend on transfers and depend on finance and technology transfers. And we haven't seen enough of that. So we need to see a lot more international cooperation in the next years if we want to have a chance. So the other message that's coming out, as I said, our path is not compatible around with our goals. Pledges are also insufficient. We need to increase pledges. On the other hand, so this is kind of on the negative side, on the, we need to do more, we have done something. But on the more positive side, the report in general, and our chapter in particular, highlight that we have seen after the Paris Agreement uh, a whole new dynamics of climate change efforts. So there are more and more activities going on. We have the net zero pledges, which is very important. More and more countries, over 100 countries already, have said that they will reduce their emissions by, by to zero in, in net terms by 2050 or 2060, by the middle of the century, roughly. So we have more and more countries doing that. We see this internationally, we see this locally, we see South-South cooperation, we see a great reduction in cost, which gives us a uh, hope that we'll be able to do it. So we, we have the technologies to do this abatement that we need. We have the technologies, especially because cost of solar, of energy have gone down dramatically. So on the positive side, we are more able than ever to meet our targets. The problem is, I mean, the target again, being the target of the, of the Paris Agreement. We are more able than ever because costs have gone down. We have a lot of action going on starting, but we need to see a lot of increase in this effort in the next years if we want to meet the targets. I don't know if that's more or less a fair summary, I hope. <laughs> and uh, overall, do you feel positive or negative on uh, what will happen at COP27 in Egypt later on this year? Will the message from your report be taken on board uh, at the negotiation stage? Yeah, the negotiations. So I think we had IPCC reports have quite a lot of influence on, 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 on COPs. That's correct. So we had a huge effort, I think, impact. A couple of years ago in 2018, the IPCC report of 1.5 degree came out, stressing the point that we need to reduce emissions to zero by 2050. As a, as, a, as a world. And from that, we have seen all the net zero targets, more and more, as I say, more than 100 countries. So, and this is almost a direct influence of that report. Now we have seen in COP26, we saw also that the, uh, the report on, on, the, on the scientific basis came out in August, again, stressing very, very clearly, it's man-made, we have climate change, there's absolutely no doubt anymore. And we saw a lot of progress in, 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 in COP26 in Glasgow. We saw a lot of new, uh, of new pledges and new things coming up. So now we will have a new report telling again the pledges are not enough. So I hope it will galvanize countries to, to increase their pledges. Whether it's going to happen already in Egypt, I don't know, because 
In Glasgow, we saw a, a big increase. I don't know if one year later we will be able to do it, but in the next years, it will definitely happen. I hope that we will be able to increase these pledges by the different countries, especially start to see that the pledges come reality. And one thing which is they have consistently failed is, is to introduce more this international cooperation on how country, which countries are gonna be helping developed countries to have the financial need the um, means that they need to have the technology that they need. This is not very clear in the Paris Agreement. It says you send your conditional pledge, you ask for something, but it's not very clear who's gonna answer. This is something they really need to work on in the, in the next years. It's not only UK, European Union saying, I'm gonna reduce my own emissions. It's not enough to reduce our emissions. We have to make a system where the whole world reduces the emissions. Because the, the big problem that we have seen in the last 10 years, so the UK has reduced emissions dramatically. It's amazing how much emission, uh, UK was able to reduce the emissions. The European Union has reduced the emissions very significantly. So you have a lot of countries reducing their emissions, but it's the world which still continues to, to increase the emissions. And that's a trend we need to, to, to change. And I think what is going to give us the answer whether we're in a good position or not, if we're able to change that trend, that not only a handful of countries are able to reduce the emissions, but the whole world is able to reduce the emissions. So personally, I hope it will happen, but this is something very difficult to predict. And it's not something that is predicted in the report. So very important also to say the report doesn't go beyond saying what, so it, because as, as is, I think in the video that we have shown earlier, the IPCC is not polyprescriptive. So the IPCC is the scientist telling, look, this is what is what we need to do. This is what we have done. Now it's up to politicians to put it into in practice and to politicians and to the general public. And that's something that for the first time, as I said, has been introduced in the IPCC reports. So the role that the public has in producing emissions. And of course, also the, the role that the public has in potentially reducing the emissions. This is something which is in part because of the whole the movement that we are seeing bottom up of people more and more interested in, in reducing climate change in mitigating climate change, the IPCC has taken note of that and has devoted a special chapter to, to study this particular issue, which is not a chapter I was involved in, but still a very relevant chapter. <laughs> Fascinating, Alejandro. And uh, I understand that plenty of scientists were involved in the report. What exactly was uh, your role? Yeah, basically this, this works like that. So do you have, uh, as I say, it's distributed into, into chapters. There is a, a, a plenary meeting at the beginning where it's decided what the chapters are going to be. And then once you know the chapters, you start looking for the authors who are able to write these chapters. And then typically they, they, they contact 10, 12, lead authors they are called and one or two coordinating authors which are kind of coordinating the effort of all these lead authors and then i am in my case i was a lead out one of the lead authors of the chapter on international cooperation then in addition you have sometimes what is called contributing authors we also have two or three of those that is one when you go together as a group you end up being 10 12 or 13. you come together as a group and you say okay now we have to write the chapter on international cooperation we have a set of bullet points which we have to to deal with necessarily Plus, we have to cover all the literature on this topic, basically try to have a look at all the literature on this topic and try to make a summary or an assessment of what, not a summary or an assessment, sorry, that was a mistake. It's supposed to be an assessment of the literature. Then you can find out that, okay, we have, we don't have expertise in this particular area. And that's where you contact a contributing author to, to work on one particular area. So that's why you see, as I said, the lead authors, which are kind of the ones writing the article, the, the chapter, and contributing authors, which are usually more focused on one particular issue where the contributing, where the lead authors thought that they needed some additional expertise. And then, as I said, there's the coordinating lead authors, which are ones kind of making sure that everything is coherent. Because at the end, how this works is you distribute your, according to your expertise, you're, you're working mainly on one section. But this is, I, I stress very much the mainly because you work mainly on one section, but we have a lot of meetings. So we discuss everything. Everything is discussed. So at the end, we are all signing the whole chapter. And although it's true that in practical terms, of course, we have contributed more to one or a few uh, sections, but we have read everything. We made our comments on everything. We have added literature to everything. So it's a very interactive process and many, many meetings to, and then you get many comments. And, and so you, you have your first draft or your zero order draft. Then you have a first order draft and you have a second order draft, a third order draft. And all of this are coming more and more comments 
Initially, they come from other co-authors from other authors from the IPCC, but then it's opened up to expert reviewers and opened up more and more. And you're always getting comments, and you have to address them and try to integrate them, include new literature you didn't include. So it's it's a very very long process, but also a very interesting process. Indeed, and uh, I understand that the contributors uh, at all level are selected somehow. So. Uh, what was the selection process like and why do you think you have been selected? Yeah, so here it was, so the, the whole process started in my particular case. It was a, 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 a Spanish author who has been a, a lead author in a previous report. He asked me, why don't you send your, your CV, your, your that you, and there's a call made in Spain. It was, it's, it's the governments at the end who appoint you. So it's the, the, there was a, a call asking to, people in Spain interested in, in participating. And then I send, I send my CV at the request of the side of this colleague. And then the Spanish government puts you in a list of the people they think are, inter, are experts in their team in the, in, the, in the particular subject. But then the list is usually much longer than what but the list that, that you end up needed, because as I said, it's about 10, 12 on one particular topic. So then it goes to the, to the IPC central uh, office, which is in Geneva. And then they, they make a selection based on your expertise and on your CV. So basically you're submitting your main publications, what you have worked on this, what, what, what are the publications that you have? And then they see whether you are, can be considered an expert in the, in the topic that you're gonna be working on. In my case, international cooperation. I have been working quite a lot on international cooperation, more focused on uh, um, from a game theoretical point of view, but not only. So always trying to integrate negotiations very much into the analysis. So my expertise is, as I say, international environmental agreements, game theory, but in particular bargaining theory and integrating the negotiation process. So I think that was the highlight was saying, well, let's have an economist who is well aware of the old international negotiations where I probably decided to keep me in. Yeah. An excellent choice, an excellent <laughs> choice. And uh, how was uh, your overall experience of participating in the report? Well, I, I think, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, it was it was a rewarding ex uh, exercise. It was very demanding in terms of time, but it was rewarding. So at the beginning, it, it also changed a lot due to the pandemic. I have to say. So because at the beginning we were supposed to meet about twice a year. It's a three it's a three plus year process. We were supposed to meet uh, every half a year, more roughly. We had a first meeting in in Scotland. We had a second meeting in in India, and then everything stopped because the pandemic hit. So then basically moved everything to online. I think it was lucky that we had the chance to, to meet first in person so that we already knew each other. It would have been tough maybe to do it everything online from the beginning, but we had already there because you, the traditional way is that you meet for one week in one, of these, in one place every six months. So as I said, six, one week we met in, in, class, in Scotland, one week in India, it was supposed to go on like that. We didn't have the opportunity to keep on meeting like that, so we had to do everything online. But because we already had known each other in these two meetings, it worked very well. So I have to say it, it worked nice, nicely, uh, and and I learned quite a lot. So we had we were fortunate to have to have some of the co-authors were also lead authors were actually very good in their area with an expertise which is does not match mine. It's different, and it's also interesting to talk to to people who study the same topic from a different perspective, be it law, political scientists, and it was interesting. So I was more kind of the economist coming to the group. It's what kind of confronting with the different people was very interesting. So I really enjoyed it and we had very long discussions. And I have to say just a curiosity, I mean, one of the person probably the ones we had, to, I don't want to add names, but we, we had to, the longest discussion, we disagreed on many, many things. Although I also have to say, I think we find a compromise on everything, a very nice compromise at the end. I'm very happy with the compromise we found. But initially, we kind of disagreed about everything, which is nice. If you ask from scientists, everyone, you have different perspectives and opinion, it's perfectly fine. And now I have to say, we almost became almost friends. So we, it's, 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 it was a very nice experience. And now we have a very nice relationship. It's, it's brilliant that you, after discussing a lot, a lot, you're able to maintain, of course, separating that you disagree on the scientific terms of something, but you can become perfect in life. It's, it's was very interesting. And I think it enriched us, or at least enriched me, having different perspectives. And it enriched the chapter, definitely, to have all these discussions and to being able to find a compromise, which is something in between which one extreme or the other extreme. I think that was very productive and very nice. 
And I also hope that a COP27 countries participating will find a compromise and will become friends as well as it happened to you, <laughs> your colleagues. And uh, what is the next phase of the IPCC works and uh, do you plan to be part of it? Yeah, as a, uh, so basically every roughly seven years, eight years, they produce a new assessment report. They, they call this a cycle, IPC cycle. So in these IPCC cycles, there are these three assessment reports that I mentioned before, science, uh, science basis, adaptation, mitigation that produce every seven years. And within this cycle, they also produce special reports. Then at, towards the end of the cycle, then it's kind of a synthesis report which summarizes everything we have, IPCC has published in the last seven years. This cycle is coming to an end. We had the special reports that we have been published in the last year. We are now finishing with the third of the uh, assessment reports. Now it's only um, remaining the synthesis report, what we have learned in the last seven years. And then a new cycle will start, which will again be seven, eight years roughly, and we'll have some special reports and we'll have towards the end a new assessment report, which will be IR7. Right now, it's a bit early to say whether I will participate again, but I think I, I found the experience rewarding. So I, I think most, most likely, yes. So as I say, it's something, it will start, the new assessment reports will start, at, I don't know exactly, but in three, four years, because it takes about three, four years to, to finalize them. So it will start again, but then earlier on, there's the process again to proposing, you know, to, to, to deciding whether you want to be a candidate or not, whether you want to participate. And I think it's, it's quite likely that they will participate again. Good luck. And uh, you are a director of the Center for Environmental Energy Economics at Dara University Business School. Um, so what kind of research are you doing there? And uh, how does this link with your work for the IPCC? Yes, so as you say, one of the researchers at the uh, uh, CS3 at the Dahom University, and I would say that more and more climate change is at the heart of the research of everyone in our center. It's pretty amazing. Everyone is kind of working directly or indirectly on climate change right now. So some people are working more on the theoretical parts of, of taxes. Some people are working more, as I said before, in my case, on international negotiation, but it's also talk about Lucia Svagia. And then, but we have people working on adaptation as well. Rick Scott was working on adaptation. Uh, Ashad is working on adaptation. You, of course, you know, you, you're, you're working also on taxes and many things which are very, very related to climate change. So more and more, as in life in general, climate change is becoming a central part of our world. And it's becoming a central part of our work in general. And of course, our center, which is devoted to the environment and energy, there was almost no escaping. So climate change is becoming more important, more and more important in our what we do. It is becoming more important in the projects that we are running. It is, of course, becoming more important in the publications that we are doing, but it's also increasingly being important in the teaching that we do. So I think it's been included more and more climate change economics because we are economists. Climate change economics at all levels, it's going to be, it's becoming more and more important as part of the curriculum at the University of Dhaka. Also, when we, we are doing a, a new series of seminars where we're going to be inviting papers, which will be very related to climate change. We are also doing a, a workshop this summer, as you're perfectly aware, uh, because we are, we are co-organizing this. I'm very fortunate to do it with you. Uh, we are co-organizing a, a workshop now, which I think is going to be very relevant on the 6th of June. And we are inviting top researchers in the field. So we had there Scott Barrett, Michael Finus, Santiago Rubio, and more and more. So it's a one-day event, but it's a really packed day uh, event, a uh, packed day, sorry. And we are going to be discussing from theoretical, but also from a more applied point of view, the um, in general climate change economics. And then we have also a very exciting round table where we are going to be discussing basically the mitigation report that we are talking to today about. And we are fortunate enough to have the two of the lead authors on the chapter of international cooperation. As I said before, we have the uh, two of the coordinating uh, uh, authors, sorry. As I said before, we have the lead authors and then we have the coordinating lead authors, which are the ones kind of putting together the, the bits and pieces that everyone is doing. And both are going to be there on uh, uh, contributing to our round table. And I think it's it's going to be very interesting because we have someone from Zurich, Tony Pat. He is going to add a point of view of political scientist, which sees right now that we are in a very interesting situation that the costs have been reduced significantly. He's going to discuss about the relevance of the cost, the reduction in cost, and how we check, tackle climate change at national and international cooperation. And then we have Lavagna coming from the University of Oxford, who is 
I would say, the big expert in the world on the Paris Agreement. I'm sure she knows about everything about the Paris Agreement. And she's gonna, it's going to be very interesting to listen to her to say what she has to say about the Paris Agreement and, of course, about our chapter on international cooperation. So I'm really, I'm really excited about this about this workshop that we are preparing. Yes, and me too. I look forward to the, to the workshop in June. And uh, so let me conclude this um, very, very nice conversation with you, Alejandro, by um, thanking you for the opportunity to learn all this work uh, undertaken by the IPCC and by yourself within the PCC report. And uh, I will... I wish you good luck with all these endeavors and uh, hopefully, and perhaps um, a COP27 in, uh, in Egypt later this year, perhaps uh, this will, uh, will make uh, a breakthrough impact to solve the challenge of climate change for these and future generations. Thank I also you. hope so. And, and thank you very much for having me here. It was a pleasure talking to you like always. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.